great. Thank you for the stage. Uh, great to be here, and I hope that people are, are ready to, to, to zoom in. So, and, and yes, as intro, intro was, that we are going to talk about uh, uh, private capital, investor view, and also grant view, point of view. So, and, and of course, in the deep tech context, but this is deep tech is nowadays a matter of definition. So I think we can take it broader way. And the setup that we are planning to have is that uh, we have a burned, I will do five minutes presentation because it's really new things. I think you are the first ones who hear about it. Creative and cultural <laughs> kick will be launched soon. And five minutes burn will do intro of it. And then we have the conversation uh, 20 minutes. But before that, uh, maybe Heidi, about a few words about yourself. Uh, please, please make sure intro of yourself and then the bird can take the stage. Thank you, Mark. Good morning. My name is Heidi Gokko. And I wear different hats, but I define myself as an investor and a mentor. I have been building up the early stage ecosystem uh, in Estonia for the last uh, 15, 16 years. I have been a fund manager. Currently, I'm an active uh, angel investor. I'm leading the angel syndicates. And also, I'm the chair of Unitar2 Ventures, so that we are building the deep tech-based um, investment facility, eventually. And also, um, I have been for the last couple of years uh, the investment committee member of the European Innovation Council's fund. And that is the biggest uh, deep tech early stage investment vehicle in Europe. And usually the funds are measured based on assets under management. So the assets under management of the EIC fund is 3 billion euros. So it is the biggest. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Bernd, please about yourself and then uh, five minutes for the slideshow. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me, having me. My name is Bernd Fesel. My background is in philosophy and economics. And while making my uh, master's in economics, I met an artist, uh, at that time a famous artist at the Art Academy in Dusseldorf, and he convinced me uh, to work in the art market. And so I learned to transform immaterial values into material values, art into cash. And that's kind of the capacity and the competence I use now also, building this innovation community. And uh, until this career now, I have been working with the European Capital of Culture, so it's a great pleasure to be here, as Tartu will be next year. We invested 100 million euros in the Ruhr region to generate change by culture, especially in the industrial uh, derelict situations. You know, we had some 100 coal mines being laid off. So I experienced really culture can make a difference if properly invested. So I'm really happy to be here. So let's start the presentation. So um, happy to produce and to, to present this uh, EIT innovation community for culture and creativity to address global challenges. So I will talk about two things. Uh, what is the culture creative industries and what are the global challenges to talk about? If you remember how you came here today, likely you will have read the news, maybe even listened to music, maybe even streamed a film. So that's all culture. But obviously you also dressed so by dressing, we all create together a global market of 1,900 billion euros every year. Obviously, we are in a building, so it's architecture. And um, if you're looking at your mobile, it is interface design. So by using culture creative industries, you know, every day, every hour, sometimes even every minute, interface design is in every mobile. You're really creating the second largest market in Europe some 450 billion euro in value added, some 3 million companies, 9 million employees. But at the same time, it's kind of hidden. It's a hidden giant because you use it so daily, self-sufficiently, it's quite often overseen. Um, still, this sector has been selected to be one of the 10 ecosystems to regenerate growth in Europe by DG Growth. Commissioner Breton decided this two years ago. So when I say culture creative industries has now an ecosystem where some 800 million euros will be invested in the next 15 years to address global challenges, what are those global challenges? And why are those global challenges relevant for Europe? Why should you care for them? And why are they relevant for culture creative industries? So the first one is 
to overcome fast fashion. Obviously, everybody understands that's something we need to tackle given all the billions and millions of tons we are throwing away. The second biggest challenge is to reduce the carbon footprint in Europe. You all know the Green Deal. Some 37% of the footprint, carbon footprint in Europe is coming alone from buildings, construction and architecture. The third challenge is in media and games. This sector doesn't even really know its footprint yet. And still, it has to reduce this by 2050, uh, by 50%. So how is this being done? Last but not least, design. If it's interface design, industrial design, furniture design, um, all this needs to be also more sustainable. There's an eco-design directive now touching some 27 sectors. This will be even increased. There will be a huge innovation push in eco-design. And last but not least, the fifth challenge is just cultural heritage. If it's built or if it's immaterial, it is challenged and threatened by the climate change, but at the same time, it can be a resource also of income source, if you think of tourism, for example. So how does an innovation community tackle all those big five challenges? Well, by not only looking at tech and business innovation, of course, those are the main pillars to start, but the creative industries has this unique approach to innovation, the artistic innovation, the imagination of the future, if it's by gamers or by authors in films. But it also has a social innovation, what I experience in the Ruhr, that if you invest in culture, in theater, in museums, in performing arts, you help revitalizing cities. And this kind of social innovation scope is also part of this innovation. To do all this, we are creating an investment club to increase the investments into creative industries. Right now, some 30 billion across Europe. We believe it can grow to some 50 billion in the next 10 years. We will create a policy club, and I'm really happy to say that the mayor of Tartu also confirmed to be part of this policy club to create better innovative frameworks so that you know artists and companies creators and entrepreneurs have a better freedom to really unleash their ideas and to create companies in a better friendly setting. And last but not least, we need to take all this buzzword bingo on innovation and funding more to citizens and to customers. We need to have a really popular story to communicate. And our consortium here, this innovation community, reaches out already with all its partners to, to some 200 million visitors and customers every year. But of course, we can't use European funding language. This needs to be told differently. We have Ogilvy, Berlinale Film Festival, Cannes Film Festival, Media Pro, European Broadcasting Union with some 2,000 media channels, so really fit to transfer this message across Europe. And this message we call the next renaissance. Of course, it's also about funding. We will spend some 50 million euros of funding every year. Calls will be out in about four weeks. And important, it's not all about funding. It's about new encounters. I, in fact, think to come back to my studies, philosophy and economics, the biggest value of this innovation ecosystem is about new encounters and not new funding. There are many other places to apply for funding. So this mix of new encounters and new funding, I hope, will really make our sector a game changer for the green digital and social transformations. So I'm happy to be here to answer your questions. Over to you. Thanks for the attention. Thank you. A round of applause for a super short, short uh, presentation. And I think now we can open up the conversation. And I think overall, what I'm hearing is that what, what you do, you are building the new networks and you are expanding the new building blocks from the creative and culture side. So I think this is really the beautiful part of it that we can have more entrepreneurs probably thanks to that um, uh, initiative and more, more, more value created. And it always starts when we're thinking about then the for, for, topic today is the funding, and I think that we thought about that there is no big drama in, inside of our, our conversation from that point of view, but the surrounding is big drama. Uh, what is the, the sentiment from the micro, macroeconomical point of view? What is the sentiment from investor point of view? I think that my question is that I believe that we, will need, we need different type of skills from the talent side who are able to uh, onboard the capital today. Is it so, Heidi? Absolutely. 
the more diversified the teams are, actually, the better it is. And um, there are very clear examples. So that if you just recall the, the COVID pandemics uh, and, and vaccination, for example, it's not about the technology, but it's more about the changing the mindset, the bringing the understanding of, uh, of the community and the culture into the process. So that I would say that uh, it's more and more about not only the technology, but how to adopt it and the social processes are those who actually define how and how fast it can be changed. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Bernd, from your side, what you have seen, that what the great fundraising uh, talents, that what they do well, uh, and how you see that, what this makes the difference from other ones? Well, I think in, in terms of skills, I would really echo and call it collaboration. You need this cross-sectoral collaboration. And as another skill, I think you really need not only digital skills in general, but really to be able to work with data across sectors. Yeah, data, if you look at AI or metaverse, it's all about the ability to create value systems and businesses on top of data. So if you don't understand data flows well, I think you're really missing something mm -hmm. to talk to investors. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, I think, to come back to philosophy, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, you, you have to have also some sense on the ethics of data, privacy, mm -hmm. all these topics, I think, is another skill, at least the sensitivity you have to have for this topic. Mm -hmm. Directly related to health tech companies, for example, also to air tech companies, so that how we handle those challenges that are out there in an ethical way, mm. and all those challenges that you presented as part of your presentation, so it can't be any like monocultural thing, it is multicultural thing, and uh, that's why it also requires the diversified teams but you'll never know when you make the first invent investment whether the all needed talent is there. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. also, as Martin Willig presenting on the other stage, when they started Bolt, they didn't know how much of a personal growth it will be. So that I would say that it's always about the adapti adaptivity and also the personal growth of the team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and Maybe. what you're saying is probably this is also that it's about like the using all the team members for the fundraising, not that this is like the, this my this this guy mandate to to, to make the fundraising rounds, but you're combining different skills and perspectives and and this diversified way point point of view it comes together. Mm -hmm. Maybe to add one topic as you're talking of this personal skill, um, of course you have to have a really good sleep, you know, even if you go bankrupt. Uh, so I think that's something you shouldn't forget. Yeah, you, you have to have this kind of standing. If you have an, a difficult situation, you're not sure about the future still, you should be stable and happy. If you are not, I mean, the startup world is maybe not your world, then you are better an employee. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, cool team, uh, really a diversified and active uh, collaboration. Great taken. Where those people have to go uh, when you're starting to, to build your fundraising plan? So where to start? How to build the community relations? Bern, you have built many communities. So what you have seen from that point of view? Well, yeah, we have built very different communities. But uh, in the field of creative industries, we are building for the very first time this investment community. So you still have sectors where there is no ideal place to meet, no natural place to meet. It's still fragmented. There are other sectors like fintech where this is much better. Mm -hmm. So it really depends uh, in what kind of sector you're diving in. Um, but in the end, I think it's a lot about personal business. It's not only going to a place and being like an event like this, but you know, having recommendations uh, to go on stage and to be recommended to investors. Uh, I think that's, from my experience, the most important uh, on those networking events. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Heidi, you, you, you know very well the student community, the nearby community. So what is the secret source here for our success? Um, networks and relationships, uh, they don't emerge like immediately. Mm -hmm. You have to focus on building their relationships. And it takes time. 
And it basically also means that uh, if somebody presents the, their company for the first time, their startup, you try to understand whether the person is, uh, is resilient, actually. So if they can really make it, if it's not so easy. Mm. So getting to know the counterparty is, is basically developing the relationship. It can be done be everywhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, switch the gear a bit and more topic towards to the matching the grant funding and also the, the, the investor capital. Because I think what we see nowadays in the funding rounds that there is not one single investor. Uh, you have to combine and you have to be constantly in the mood of the onboarding and fundraising. And then uh, one of the opportunities in the current situation that we see that the funding is more complicated is that to rely on more the kind of different grants. So, so um, Heidi, you have been on the ESC side and you have seen that how, what are the challenges of, of combining the investor capital and also the, the grant capital? Yeah, uh, it requires an, another session. So that, uh, <laughs> just to be very brief, uh, there are certain traps also involved in, in grant funding. And it's not always easy to combine the grants and the private money as uh, equity investments. Uh, I would warn about one significant issue. It's uh, getting into the grant trap. So that if you see that basically you are able to fundraise based on grants, but sometimes you are losing your focus on developing the true thing because uh, it seems to you that after receiving the grant, you will have a sufficient runway and you forget about validating the technology or the product or the business model against the market. So that is probably the most uh, important thing to keep in mind. At the same time, if you develop a deep tech company, it requires a lot of money. And there's another trap. The other, other trap is uh, insufficient funding. I have a couple of companies in my portfolio that are deep tech companies, and I clearly see that they have insufficient funding. You can't be in a constant fundraising mode because the, the, the fundraising and the growth is not linear. It basically comes in steps so that you have to have first the proof of concept, the proof of product market fit, the proof of business model. You need the sufficient funding in order to achieve the next qualitative milestones. And if you run out of money just before that, it is a waste of resources. <coughs> so that there are so many different traps you have to be aware of. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and Bern, you are in the luxury situation from the setting up the kick creativity and culture that you can bit of design uh, the, the actual frame, framework for it. So what, what is your view about how, how to build? And, and I think another way, as you mentioned, that this, this sector is not matured yet. So that's another like the opportunity and the challenge as well. So what, what you see that how to, how to make everyone to collaborate uh, from the yeah. funding point of view? Yeah. Well, you, you know, a kick is investing uh, in three big areas, uh, creating new masters with universities, supporting innovation, which goes quickly to market. So here it's not about another research project, but really having innovation so close to market that within a year or 18 months you have a market uptake and even first earnings. And then the really creation of startups or even scale-ups. Of course, with universities, it is 100% funding, but we also want to incentivize universities to take the master as a product and replicate it across Europe. This is one of the most difficult tasks <laughs> to make universities entrepreneurial. But with the investments in startups, it's exactly the trap you're talking of. Uh, we want to make clear that our funding is not just a grant, but it's uh, turned into equity to be understood as an investment. Mm -hmm. We have to really leave this grant trap from the very first start and make clear you don't, you know, you don't lay back and say, wow, I have now 100% funding for five years and I can relax. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, I think just with deep tech, and the big amount of insecure investments you have at the very start. The public funds can be really a good support at the very beginning, but it's the hardest sell to public policymakers to say, look, you give it 10 million and we don't give you any market chances because it is deep tech. No idea if it will fly. But if you look at Metaverse now, I think a lot of people in Europe still believe it's a chance to invest, can be. 
I don't know if it's too late, you might know this better, but I think here your public funding can really be a stepping stone for later than risk capital from the private sector. Yeah, we have to keep in mind that uh, in which stage of technology readiness uh, the company is, so that it's very, very difficult to fundraise if there is a TRL level like six, uh, for example, or five, six. So that basically the, the grant also, at least the EIC grants, they would like to see that the private market is somehow involved, that they are interested, that they understand the value of the tech or the product. Mm -hmm. And I would recommend definitely to use the, the grant money or public funding to develop those technologies and products to the certain level, but then also then to to test the reality, whether the private market also sees the value in those uh, developments. So that let's think about the grants as the enabler or as something that can leverage the capital. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's, this, uh, just allow me to, to take this up, you know, this innovation community we are building is not just an innovation agency where you give the fund, but you provide with this ecosystem approach a network across 15 sectors, 40 nations. We applied with some 50 partners and they are again in some 150 networks and they reach again to some 250,000 individuals. So our idea is also to give uh, alongside of the capital also the contact to the first client, ideally, to have a really quick market uptake and mm -hmm. within this network um, within this diversity, you hopefully, you know, connect much quicker to your first client, mm -hmm. and then it is commercialized, hopefully. Yeah. I just wanted to add that that is uh, the importance of the ecosystem, because if you, if you think of a, of a plant, it cannot be just grown mm. in the middle of nowhere. Basically, it needs the conditions. And, and also, if, for example, if we started to invest into startups in Estonia like 15 years ago, there, and there was nothing, there was like no business angels, so that we understood that basically in order to make private investments into early stage uh, startups, whether technology startups or deep tech startups, you need the investors actually who understand the logic how to invest into the early stage companies without ruining them. <laughs> so yeah. that that is the, the value of the ecosystem and the networks and, and building the, yeah. the yeah. bigger universe yeah. around yeah. those uh, startups. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think what, what you're saying is about, first of all, that yeah, to build uh, the uh, capitalist mindset as, as soon as possible, more or less, not kind of rely on the grant mindset. So, but on the other hand, I think to help to, to reach that point, but then this community point of view as well, I think overall, what we feel, it's maybe not European overall, that the deep tech investment community is under construction at the moment still here. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. is not ready, ready. So I think from the founder point of view also, I think that's probably, you have to be quite patient that, that it doesn't mean that it's wrong with you. The ecosystem is also might be not ready yet. So being persistent yeah, yeah, and you, keep, you, keep pushing. You, you can be also too early, you know, even if you have a lot of capital and a great idea if the market is not really ready. Yes. So those things, community, capital, um, uh, and people, you know, they have to merge on this magic point of time and then it flies. Yeah. So you need yeah. some luck as well, I guess. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to say that uh, the speed of the development has changed significantly. Mm. So that five years, ten years ago, it was like, okay, we do it it's step by step. Now it's like the fast-paced train that is basically rushing through. Or, or a rocket, basically, so that you have to be really, really fast. If you, if you look at the speed of the development of technology, then the ecosystem and all supportive measures actually have to be as fast yeah. as possible. Yeah. And sometimes it's really challenging to, to make the public sector to react as fast as the market demands. Yeah, yeah. Just to pick this up, um, you know, Classical ecosystems and networks of the last 10 or 15 years, they're also reaching their boundaries now. If you invite people to networking uh, and you watch them, you, they usually just talk to the people they know already. Yeah? So yeah, just yeah. meeting is not an icebreaker for new encounters. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. So uh, we also look into our innovation community here, how to use AI uh, and other emerging technologies to take networking into a next level 
because just you know to do it like the last 10 years won't work okay it's not so, speedy enough yeah so your recommendation is really to mix different communities to be in different places and in this accelerated learning so mm -hmm. new environment but you have to learn fast that's that's yeah. the only secret source to be so long run long run successful that you can do as a team if I can have a sort of a last uh, recommendation to the startup founders, then my uh, recommendation would be don't focus on uh, getting the grants or don't focus on fundraising the investor money. Focus on building your business, understanding the customer needs and the problem that you are really solving. If you are good in that, the money will follow. Yeah. Very good uh, recommendation, final one. Thank you. And maybe we'll have some Q&As as well from the audience. Um, yeah, for, for the questions, uh, no one has uh, asked anything. So uh, insight.votomo.eu, uh, please ask your questions there. And uh, the earlier you do them, the more uh, likely they are to actually get asked. Um, I will ask uh, one question myself, because I'm in the uh, how to say, creative industries myself, being a stand-up comedian and so on. Um, <laughs> uh, my, my, my question would be, like, if you look at cre like creative people, technically aren't the best with money as, as my experience is or, or sort of trying to ask for money as well like how how difficult actually is it to find people to invest in because I would imagine like when I started like 12 years ago when there wasn't stand up in Estonia and we started we didn't know we could ask anyone money or so on so how, how difficult do you actually have to go and find these people because I'm, I imagine not a, a lot of creative people are trying to find stuff themselves. Yeah, thanks for, for asking this really um, pointed question. In fact, the image of creative industries is not so good with investors. But if you look at Ubisoft, if you look at Vivendi, if you look at Bertelsmann, I mean, this is all creative industries, global players. They have their own investment companies investing again into creative industries, the whole media sector, film industry. Uh, so I think we really have to do some polishing of our image, but also to clear point, you know, more the opportunities. There are no really foresight studies. If you look at Ernest and Young and others when they're publishing their investment reports, you maybe find them on beauty, but, you know, not on gaming and others. So there's still a lot to be done on due diligence and on fact-finding, on transparency. If you look into crunch, base and other databases, you don't even find creative industries as a, as a sector listed where you can just look up how many investments there are. You have to calculate that yourself, you know, from event industries to uh, something else like media. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so we didn't get any questions uh, earlier, but uh, again, for the next speakers, please ask your questions earlier, then we can ask them. Uh, thank you very much for your time. We have run out of time, so uh, please, a round of applause for our panelists. Yeah.